I, I saw this movie like a couple times when it came out. Yeah, uh, I had never seen this film at the theaters. I saw the. It was kind of sold to me, but my dad's oh, that's sort of like Mash, just not in the war. And I watched it, and it was sort of like Mash, yeah. except not in the war. Um, and even though I think seventy five percent of this movie just operated way above my head, I, I couldn't have I couldn't have understood anything. Well, I think when George C. Scott's talking about impotency, I don't even think I knew what impotency was. You know, as a ten year old in seventy one, however old I was, but. I still thought it was really funny. I still really, really liked it. And I thought George C. Scott was fucking amazing, even though I didn't understand what he was talking about or didn't even under, couldn't even understand what, what Patty Chayesky was talking about. And I was still mesmerized. But I hadn't seen it in uh, uh, quite a long while. I, and I brought it up to Roger and realized he hadn't seen it at all. And I thought it was time that we threw a really great writer into the mix of our show, which I don't think we, we've, we've had good writers, but I think this is our first really great writer that we've thrown into uh, uh, the mix of the show. I wanted to do that. And I wanted to, because we like George C. Scott so much, and we've enjoyed watching his performances on the show this season so much that I wanted him to kind of uh, finally uh, 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 meet Rod Steiger's status where, uh, so we've had officially, th uh, I think three Rod Steiger movies or four Rod Steiger movies. We've got like three, George C. Scott movies. We have to have at least three. Okay, so the back of the key video box it says in bold headline, George C. Scott in the award-winning satire of medicine's darker side. In the hospital, interns chase the nurses. Patients die from neglect. Doctors quote the stock market and mayhem is all in a day's work. The prognosis looks dark, and the only antidote is brilliant satire in this richly textured black comedy about a large metropolitan hospital that won its creator, Petty Chayefsky, an Academy Award. The great George C. Scott is head of this macabre circus, a man who copes with his problems by swigging vodka and contemplating suicide. And the over 63 different characters, including an administrator who requests Blue Cross numbers from a very dead corpse, and a crazed mystery man who's methodically killing off the staff, and you have a blistering, funny, and highly acclaimed commentary that is guaranteed to make you think, even while it makes you laugh. 1972, color 103 minutes. Roger. What did you think of The Hospital, having seen it for the first time? Well, um, I found this Franklin Brenner review, which happens to be perfectly in line with uh, with how I felt about the film. Great. I th or at least closely in line, as close as he's ever been. Despite being totally absurd, any personal experience being a patient trapped in the medical system legitimizes even the most ludicrous moments of Arthur Hiller's swing at Chayefsky branded social commentary, 1971's The Hospital tailor-made for George C. Scott to scene steal with his usual virile bravado, here employed playing an impotent doctor, the bear actor gnashes and masticates his way through the carcass Chayefsky has laid out for him, the bureaucracy of American medicine, and the failures of systematic intolerance and self-interest. Hiller, for his part, stays out of Scott's way, despite the tight spaces and corridors, but never lets his eye off the grinding magnificence of that fury-soaked performance, only cutting to punctuate. This is Hiller at his finest, indulging the talent to comic inspiration and allowing the language of the camera to evolve from the language of the performance, itself derived from the rhythms of Chayefsky's particular theatrical patois, which is why the film is titled Patty Chayefsky's The Hospital, because it is. Well said. Well, and it really is Patty Chayefsky's The Hospital because it's like watching a play, but it is Hiller's game, man, because mm -hmm. Hiller, uh, who, you know, when he's great, he's great. Mm -hmm. And when he's not, he's not so great. But mm -hmm. here he's great. His talents are put perfectly into um, employment. Hiller was a great old school Director. Now, the thing about it is great old school studio directors are assigned all kinds of movies. And so, look, when he does Nightwing, it's not in the same level as when he does The, <laughs> the Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he does Making Love, it's not in the same level as when he does uh, The Americanization I mean, of he Emily. Did, he did Plaza Suite the same year. Yeah. <laughs> like 
He's a director who knows how to deal with uh, a writer's material. Yeah. He knows how to take writer's material, uh, 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 heavily written material, and then dramatize it and bring the best out of it. Now, before The Hospital, he did Patty Chayefsky, what I consider his other great movie script, which is uh, The Americanization of Emily. Yeah. That has a monologue that is, I, I think, in the top three monologues of all time. The uh, uh, James Gardner is uh, telling the British old lady about uh, his brother's death in the war, about how not to romanticize military service. Mm-hmm. That whole that whole movie is fantastic, and he does it again with the hospital. And the same year, he'll attack uh, Neil Simon with Plaza Suite, and so, you know, he's the guy that you bring in to to do these terrific writers and figure out how to bring the best out of them, how to bring the best out of the actors, how to get the best out of the dialogue and how to get the best drama or comedy out of a scene, how to put it on its feet dramatically. Yeah. And, and, and the best way live. to do that is to stay out of the way mm-hmm. on a personal level and serve the material, which you can really feel like this is a director who's workshopped it. They've rehearsed it. Mm-hmm. They've done proper rehearsal. I mean, they've mm-hmm. done rehearsals probably for weeks on this. I, uh, no, I would, I would, I would imagine that you know, if, if a normal long rehearsal for a movie is uh, two weeks, then I would imagine that the hospital was probably four weeks rehearsal. But one of the things that Hiller uh, does to ground these these projects, like for instance, in the case of Love Story, you know, he had a really fun script and a real fun movie which no this is a good emotional package an audience goes and sees this movie they're going to they're going to have a end up having a good time at the movies it's a good emotional fun movie i say fun you cry at the end of it but that's fun All right. uh, um in the case of both his two leads Ryan O'Neill and Ali McGraw their chemistry is wonderful together now Arthur Hiller sells that in the whole first half of the movie by having scenes that, that uh, of the two of them uh, just doing their banter back and forth, a little patter back and forth, uncut. Yeah. And so for the first half of the movie, oftentimes big scenes with them are played in long, unbroken takes. So you actually see that they actually do have chemistry together. They actually belong together. You actually like them together. And it's not the movie making that happen. That actually literally just is their dynamic. And consequently in the hospital, he has long, long, long uh, George C. Scott monologues delivered without any cuts whatsoever. And not just monologues, entire dialogue-driven scenes. Oh, this uh, goes like, on and on and on. He might move the camera to a different position to give the illusion of a, of a, a cut. that you've seen a cut. Yeah. But it, I, I was stunned at how long he held. Again, again especially in the first Scott. half. Especially in the, the first, first half, half yeah. yeah. And he goes out of the way as 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 crazy as and absurd as the movie is to really ground the hospital in uh, uh, a recognizable chaos going a on. A realistic chaos. A very a very real. Like it's not overfilled. It's it's not ridiculous. Now, okay. Here's the thing, though. I think there is a difference between the first half of the movie and the second half of the movie. And the first half of the movie is the realistic part yeah. of of the film. And, uh, and then it starts spinning off axis. And then it starts spinning off its axis. And as crazy and as hysterical as the movie is at the beginning. He's doing the thing that television later with Hill Street Blues will do of just bustling characters, moving, uh, moving in their jobs, moving down corridors, going in and going out. He's doing the same thing he uh, Chayefsky will later do with uh, Altered States, having characters just barrel through technical jargon yeah. <laughs> at, a, at a rapid pace. But the actors seem to know what they're talking about <laughs> as they bombard you with their jargon as they walk down these halls, at, at, usually at, the, at, at full volume. Well, in the case of uh, Altered States, always at full always volume. Always at full volume, yeah. <laughs> um, but look, I just, I have an issue with the film that actually is less an issue and more of a point of departure to talk about the film. But I just thought The Hospital was just fantastic. It knocked me out. I've seen it before, but uh, but watching it with you, it was really, really special. And I I actually think George C. Scott gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. Not not just, I mean, it's just one of the best performances I've ever seen. On one hand, even though I didn't understand what he was talking about, I think I understood that as a little boy. But now watching it as an older man, I almost feel that I, I, there's a, there was a quote once that most men end their lives in anguish. And I think that actually is true. I think most men do end their lives in anguish. And uh, 
I think there's something to George C. Scott's character and to his id that he reveals that once you get older, that it's just kind of devastating. That I, I see something of myself in him at this age. All right. You know, and it's none of the high points. It's just that there, but, but there is an anguish there. Yeah. There is an anguish there that uh, I, I, I wouldn't have related to at any other time in my life, but now I'm at the right age that I can, I, I, I think it's one of the best characters I've ever seen in my life. And I think it's one of the best performances I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I too am really glad that I saw this movie. I mean, you saw it as a young boy and mm-hmm. also now, but I'm glad I saw this movie at the age that I'm at because what George C. Scott is going through is not uncommon. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're right. Um, and and he's so electrifying mm-hmm. throughout all of it. Mm-hmm. There's only a few moments where um, I I start to feel the the theater mm-hmm. of it all, yeah, the yeah. kind of stagey kind of mm-hmm. um, dialogue, but that's... Chayefsky, I accept that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is and, that is what it is. That's like that's like complaining that there's the uh, there's too many one liners in, in Neil Simon. Well, that's who the fuck he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like saying Tennessee Williams is too gothic. Well, then what the fuck are you gonna do? All right, don't watch Sweeper Review. Uh, either there's two things in this movie that um, potentially derailed the film for me and didn't, mm-hmm. and uh, one of them we'll talk about later. Uh, maybe. Yeah. And that's Bernard Hughes's uh, arc. Arc. Yeah. His whole arc. And the other one is Diana Rigg, who's the mm-hmm. only other person other than George C. Scott, the only other actor mm-hmm. other than George C. Scott credited in the opening credits. Mm-hmm. I am a massive Diana Rigg fan. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I know you are yeah, as, as well. Absolutely. And um, when she showed up in the movie um, at first, I was not so into her character. She was my least favorite mm-hmm. character in it, but then on the power of George C. Scott, mm-hmm. And her, uh, her basically, her interfacing with his rage mm-hmm. was so brave and um, f- uh, fearless as an actress. I see why she's um, uh, given that credit next mm-hmm. to Scott. The, she has to ride that wave. Well, uh, we need to describe this a little bit, especially for me to give my take on it, is um, Scott is so perfect in this movie. And, and this is not just me keep throwing platitudes, but it's like... Um, like the costume he wears in the film, the checkered shirt and the and the the, the kind of soiled tie a, a little bit that he wears throughout the whole film. Everything seems perfect about that. His glasses seem perfect. The grease in his hair seems perfect. The mixture of dark and gray in his hair. Everything just seems... And even when he cleans up, yeah, it's perfect. Uh, yeah, it's perfect, yeah. He just kind of... Yeah, he's the same guy, but with a coat of paint on him. Yeah. All right? Yeah, yeah. He, he just watched, watched the he watched the sleep out of his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> or he threw some cold water in his face, and he actually woke up for a fucking second. Yeah. Um, in the film, yeah, it just, you know, he's, he's been going through a terrible divorce from a terrible marriage... Uh, if he's not the administrator. He's that, like, you know, I guess he's the head doctor of the yeah, hospital. He's like one of the head doctors. He's the guy who trains all of the residents. Yeah, yeah. He's basically the head doctor. But the hospital is beca- is is becoming a Byzantine farce, all right, of uh, uh, of what a hospital should be. I think they even say a Roman farce. Yeah, well, he point. does call it a Roman farce at a certain. He calls it a Roman farce on a terrible Gothic horror show. <laughs> <laughs> the Gothic horror show, it is for sure. <laughs> uh, and you know, the whole thing in the hospital is is like you know. People come in for minor situation and then this weird thing happens and this weird neglect thing happens and then somebody reads something wrong and the next thing you know, the guy's dead. Yeah. Five, f- five days later, the guy's dead. And, so, it, it, and and you know what? And if you can make that leap to uh, believe that that actually happens, well, I bought, I bought it then everything in the movie works. <laughs> well, that's the part that's actually played the most realistically are those, yeah. are those were Byzantian things that happen. A guy comes in for a simple this and then three days later, he's in a coma uh, uh, because of neglect, not reading shit right, doing just because, it wrong. It, just because the bureaucracy and the hospital itself has become so big, it can't control itself. It can't yeah. organize itself. The whole thing the bureaucracy, is making the bureaucracy, a metaphor for America. The bureaucracy runs it. Yeah. All right. So when the bureaucracy is wrong, it doesn't know it's wrong. And, and, <laughs> and because when, there's not a human being to write it. And how can they organize? Because there's, in the meantime, you know, th- there's a huge protest going on. The hospital is trying to expand yeah. so that it can expand. Yeah. But in its expansion, it's only becoming bigger and worse yeah, and it's of kick- a monster, and of an octopus. And it's kicking uh, residents. It's out destroying of their neighbor, the neighborhood yeah, unintentionally yeah. in trying to save people. So the thing is, so he's so, so he carries all this around. He's like he's he's a suicidal. He he's not only reeling from the divorce; he's reeling from the twenty years of the bad marriage. Yeah, <laughs> he's estrangement from his children. 
And he, and he's coming to terms with everything. He's like, mm-hmm. yeah, my kids, like he doesn't like either of them. Yeah. yeah. He's a communist. She's like, yeah. uh, you know, and it's just like pregnant or some just, dude. Everything uh, kind of comes down on him, you know, and then he's realizing these, this ridiculous situations that are happening in the hospital that just seem like, like grand Goulion yeah. <laughs> farce. And so then he's sitting in his office and he's contemplating suicide. Now, he has met Dinah Riggs' character earlier on because her dad is in a coma that he shouldn't be in in the hospital. And she wants to take him out. And uh, he sees her talking with the uh, the doctor and he even says, like, who is that? And they go, oh, well, that's this missionary who works with the Apaches. Who th- th- That thing happened. Then there's an Apache uh, uh, medicine man there who's doing a special dance for his father. And like Dorsey Scott has to give them the okay to do it. So he talks to Diana Rigg a little bit there, gets a sense of her and gives her the okay. Yeah. She convinces him it's not a medical thing. It's a religious practice. It's a religious practice. And that's how they can allow it to happen in the hospital. And he's like, okay, fine. You know, uh, and then he has a, a small talk with her in her, her office and then she leaves and then- he contemplates killing himself right then and there by shooting himself up with potassium. And so he actually draws the potassium. Yeah, he does more in, than in contemplate. The yeah, yeah. He's, he's doing in, the, it. in the syringe, he wraps up his arm to make the vein pop with his belt. And he's going to shoot himself up. And she just inexplicably walks back into the office yeah. and goes, hey, what are you doing? All right. She thinks he's getting high. And this, but she's a she's a nurse. She knows that that potassium would kill him, and they proceed to have this big conversation that goes on and on. It's 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 the, and in the, classic Jersey Scott form, he's like a volcano that's just slowly simmering, ready to explode. He's absolutely a volcano. Also, Petty Chayefsky is a volcano. This entire movie has been written to this scene. This is the scene where it will all erupt both literary-wise and drama-wise, mm-hmm. and George C. Scott-wise. Yeah. And she's provoking, and she's provoking, because he says he's impotent, but she actually can, can tell, well, I like you, I like middle-aged men. And, and he's getting drunker and drunker and drunker and drunker until finally, in a vodka-fueled drunken rage, he ravishes her, like, rips her clothes off, forces himself on her, and actually proves that he's not impotent. Now, what you have to also understand in a lot of these movies when this happens is uh, uh, what Patty Chayefsky is doing here and what they're doing as far as even telling the the story. It's not about should somebody do this, should somebody not do this. This is all allegorical. Uh, 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 yeah, even the crowds outside are allegorical. It's, it's an allegorical expression of lust and manhood that happens. It's a literary thing, ultimately. She actually did like him. It seemed like that was the aspect that she was trying to lure out of him to show him that he was and, and, and to provoke him like the bear that he is, is the way to do it. And it works. And then from that point on, then the movie is, is different. And then a, an interesting aspect is added to it where it almost becomes a, like a, it borders on a silly romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. All right. Where it's like Diana Rigg is, look, I love you. You love me. So why don't you just leave all this behind all your misery and then just go with me to Mexico and we'll live amongst the Apaches and we'll be together and yeah, we'll have we'll, a baby and we'll live life. And goes, I can't do that. What are you talking about? You almost killed yourself an hour ago. I'm offering you something else. Now I have to say your um, delivery of that um, proposition to me is better than the movie presents because mm-hmm. to me, the movie becomes very stagey mm-hmm. theatrical for that one moment. It's the only moment that I really felt, um, like I wasn't even sure I believed that in the film that she wanted him to run off with her. Well, I think I'm in that, love with you, George C. Scott. Well, there's an interesting thing growling, here: growling, gristly, patchy bear, all angry and scarred. Well, I I actually think George C. Scott looks very virile in this movie. Well, he I, I, he does. Just, well, he always looks virile. He yeah, looks like, like, like he looks very like he looks as virile in this as he does in the last run. All right. Uh, um, I took that at face value mm-hmm. when I watched the movie. But I've been thinking about the hospital all weekend long. Me too. Since I saw it. And I think there's a case to be made of another reading of the movie. The whole movie builds to that middle scene between George C. Scott and and Diana Rigg. 
then it happens and it changes everything. Now, now, admittedly, the events in what happens, him ravishing her and, 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 and having this new lease on life and everything, those would be events that would change everything. But it doesn't just change everything as far as the events that are being portrayed. The entire movie is different after that. All the weird, absurd comedy that happens in the first half of the movie is still grounded in reality. Those little stories about how this patient came in for this and ended up this happening to them and that happening to them, and that all sounds very convincing. You buy it. Mm -hmm. You absolutely buy it. Uh, there is also, there's this killer going around killing doctors and nurses, and we see this going on throughout the film to some degree. After the second half, things are never grounded again. Things start becoming far more absurd. Things become far less plausible. Things are more hysterical than they were before. Um, almost and, almost and, outlandish. They're, so. no, they're outlandish. Everything gets more surreal. Everything gets more out of control. I don't buy the things that are going on anymore. There is a reveal of who's doing the, these murders in the hospital. I didn't buy the reveal. I didn't buy the whole story about it. I didn't I didn't buy it. I just didn't buy it. I didn't find it plausible. I didn't buy it. Oddly enough, even when we watched it, that didn't bother me. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you're somebody like Patty Chayeski, you're always swinging for the fence. And sometimes I'll go with you and sometimes I won't, but it doesn't ruin the whole game. But here's where I'm going with this. Over the week I started thinking about it. I don't think Diana Rigg is real. At all? Here's what I think. I think he did see her in the hallway. I think he did see her in You're the hallway. In, in Gala territory. No, I'm yeah. not. I, I think there. I think you can back it up. I think. Uh, I, I think the movie backs it up. Georgie Scott saw her talking. You know, and he go, oh, "Who's that?" You know, so she's somebody who caught his eye. Then he got together with her to give her the okay on on uh, the medicine man. Got so he got a sense of her. Got a sense of how she talked and everything. Oh, she's British. Got that. All right. Then they have their little scene. And then she leaves. I'm taking my father out and that's it. Boom. That is it. She's left. That's it. She's gone from the movie. She's gone. She left his life. Boom. Then he goes. He gets the potassium. He wraps up his arm. He's about ready to commit suicide. And then inexplicably, an angel comes back. There's no reason for her to come back. She doesn't come up with a reason why she came back. Mm -hmm. She comes back and she literally becomes an angel the moment she comes back. She literally saves George C. Scott in every way she can possibly save him. If we're to take him at face value, he was going to kill himself right there. So right there, by walking into the room, she saves his life. Then she proves to him that he is a man and that, he, uh, that his impotency is, is, is based out of his own dissatisfaction. Uh, and so she, so she brings him back to life as, as a man, as a living person, as somebody who actually cares about life. And then, and I love you. And I want you to go with me. And we can live this love. This is what he wants. These are the things he doesn't have. And then this fantasy woman that he just had a small encounter with comes in and you know and 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 shows him this way. And, now, all, and all she does is offer him a future that he will deny so that he can continue with the hospital. Exactly. And now it makes sense that everything is so fucking crazy out of control because we are now being told the story. We are now, from the second point on, we are being told the story by an unreliable narrator. Yeah, I mean, even that riot that's going on outside starts to feel like the riot in Inception. Yes, inside exactly. Inside yeah, of yeah. the dream. It's like no. this weird abstract riot. He's just drank uh, like a full Absolutely. bottle. Absolutely. It's unrealistic that this angel can come in and cure all of his problems. He needed the catalyst of an angel for him to cure his own problems. I mean, I like the movie more that way, yeah. to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and again, I'm not certain that that's how it is. It seems as far-fetched as any of my highfalutin ideas mm -hmm. that I come up with on movies. Ha having said that, I like it better. It, it, it gives me a nice escape valve for mm -hmm. that scene between him and Diana Rigg, which mm -hmm. I just felt impossible in some ways mm -hmm. like because you're right well, i love you i love you you love me yeah, let's go like, together let, let's go and you like and, and, that, and suddenly that's the whole debate in the end the problem i had with bernard hughes uh in it 
evaporated after a while because I started thinking about all the stuff they were saying about the hospital and how um, the bureaucracy means that nobody really knows what they're doing and nobody really cares. Everybody's just going like they're at the DMV. They may as well be working at the DMV. Yeah, yeah. They don't really care that you don't know who you're injecting with what you're just told to do it. So you do it. Mm -hmm. You're here, you're there. You don't, you know, people are coming and going. There's a hundred doctors working there. Many of them don't, aren't even, uh, permanently at the hospital. They just come and they work at the hospital. Mm -hmm. They do, they do operations at the hospital, like Richard Dysart's, yeah. uh, strongly capitalistic uh character who I, I actually loved his i love richard dysart me too from yeah. the thing but he, he's perfect in yeah. this role when he gives that little tax speech oh yeah he's like uh, how speech, to incorporate it was so realistic because i could not understand it oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it means it must have been real because <laughs> i absolutely couldn't i can't understand those things <laughs> so i started thinking about it over the weekend i was like you know in the reality that they build this hospital and the statement that they're making about, you know, American bureaucracy mm -hmm. and corporate uh, services for people, it's believable. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely believable that no one knows shit about what's going on at any given moment in that in that building. Mm -hmm. And um, and that people are only there for the self interest and you know uh, and for the money like Richard. Well, Dyson. that just backs up your thoughts about. Well, the and and then I and then I got and I got to say, <laughs> of course you like this movie. <laughs> well, and then well I got to say George C. Scott does too because yeah. right after this he goes and he does Rage. Right after this he does Rage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like he goes out and he's like, I got more in me. I got more lead in my pencil. And so he goes out. He's still pissed at uh, doctors. And he brings Bernard Hughes and the great Robert Walden with him. Yeah, yeah that's right. Everybody, hey guys, come on. You, I got more to say on this yeah, subject. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, wasn't it great after Rage to see Robert Walden walking around again? It yeah. was so cool. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> wonderful. Movie. Quentin, I'm kind of mad that I didn't think of that. Also, <laughs> like, to be honest, I think this that's, is, your, that's that's your pushant. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm kind of mad uh, that I wasn't the one that brought that to the table because I think this might be one of my favorite discussions you guys have had mm -hmm. specifically because of that theory, mm -hmm. because that theory that you have fixes my issue with this movie, mm -hmm. which is yeah. that reveal of like you killed God at yeah, that yeah, certain yeah, yeah, point. Yeah. It's uh -huh. just I, I didn't buy that, but. I mean, it, it all becomes very heady and uh, is, and New York playwright. Oh yeah. But what's, like, but what's it, what's interesting to me is the fact that I didn't buy that or care for it either, and it didn't affect my feeling it, on the movie. Yes, I, I mean, I have a little heart. <laughs> I have a little heart on my top corner. I yeah. loved this movie. Uh. When I was watching, I'm like, oh, yeah, more medical malpractice because I loved coma. You're like the only right? person I know who says, yeah, more medical malpractice. <laughs> you should become an attorney. <laughs> well, I loved coma and I'm watching this. And I'm like, oh, is this like kind of like coma for the boys? Like it's yeah. like kind of like <laughs> yeah, it, it's coma with Jersey Scott yeah. lose, a, losing his shoes as, a, as opposed to Jean Pierre Bougeau. Yeah. <laughs> and I gotta say, I actually like this better than Coma, uh, and I really, really like Coma. That was so, one of your favorite movies. It was of one of my favorite movies, and I really, really like The Hospital. Mm -hmm. I wish that I remembered what. Diana Riggs's dad says to George C. Scott, like when he goes to choke him, mm -hmm. I wish I remember because he says that line to him, like some religious line. And I feel like that could play into your theory, which yeah. evaporates all of my issues about the movie. It evaporates my issue about the end being wacky. And also <laughs> uh, I wanted them to be together in the end. And yeah, yeah. It evaporates that issue as well. I agree that there's a weirdness to the Diana Rigg character. And I started putting it under the microscope and then it hit me, hit me on Saturday. Well, there, regardless, there is a kind of supernatural oracle like quality to Bernard Hughes's character because mm -hmm. he seems to know everything that's going to happen, everything that has happened, everything that's going to happen, all the minutia details mm -hmm. when he's talking about Richard Dysart's character. And you're like, uh, they will assume that his well, partner and it, in Brazil. Da, 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 da. Like and he, it's absurd that this like <laughs> missionary from Mexico, they've had would know the intricacies of all these different doctors and nurses and what yeah. they did wrong to all these different people, not just him. Yeah, it's like Exorcist 4. Yeah. Like, or something in the hospital yeah. <laughs> um as quentin and roger said the be like the first half of the movie is really grounded in reality if you want to know more about medical malpractice i would recommend reading gawande's book complications a surgeon's notes on an imperfect science which literally is just this movie it's all of like him being like an intern into being a doctor of like all the medical malpractice that he witnessed and what happens to diana rigg's father is really normal that you go in for a biopsy and then all of a sudden it's like you nick this and you nick that and then you're in a coma and then you die. Happened to my mom. Happens all the time. 
So, uh, and also Groupman's How Doctors Think, if you really want to get into medical malpractice, like for some reason I did. <laughs> uh, George C. Scott is so sexy in this movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching it, I'm thinking, God, he's just like great. He's punchy. I mean, with Patty Chayefsky's dialogue behind him, which the script uh, for this movie, The Hospital, won the Academy Award that year yeah. for Best Screenplay, and it deserves it. Deservedly so. My favorite line uh, in the movie, or there's a few, but one of my favorite lines that George C. Scott's yelling is, where do you train your nurses? Dachau? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. That is yeah. such a good line. He tells that to Nancy Marchand, who's yeah, yeah. the uh, yeah. head of the nursing staff. She was on The Sopranos. And this movie, like, George C. Scott is literally just moving the entire movie. Like, he's just going, and it's so fluid. And, of course, Victor Kemper, DP yeah. on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Like, of course, our man Kemper is mm-hmm. coming in hot with just— and, and I, look, and, and His I, work is so good on this and so restrained I, and fantastic. And I completely agree with you about how sexy George C. Scott is. I found it very believable that, that Diana Rigg was into him. Oh, he's, expo- <laughs> yeah. he's exploding with testosterone throughout yeah, yeah, the movie. Yeah, like, uh, and, and it's all bottled up, and he's just like this— <laughs> For a man who's playing it— Impotent. impotent. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's so not impotent. It's actually funny to actually now now that we have a George C. Scott impotent movie, we had a Rod Steiger impotent movie yeah, yeah, with yeah. Dirty Hands. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So now we both got both of them being impotent. Yes, exactly. And boy, they're the most uh, impotent uh, brothers. Yeah. They're the most <laughs> testosterone <laughs> rodeo bulls of uh, of impotence. Of impotence of all time. <laughs> I really liked the shaman sequence where the shaman is uh, praying over her uh-huh. father. Uh-huh. Um, one, it's like taking place during a thunderstorm. So it just has like this mystic thing. And of course, I mean, the Chayevsky like altered states connection with like mm-hmm. the Native Americans and indigenous people and just like the mysticism behind it. It's like so Chayevsky. I love it. But my favorite part of that sequence is actually the black nurse. Yeah. She is so that's the one part of the movie that I actually found funny. Like I didn't, the one, the desk nurse who like when she turns her head, like. Oh, the way like she she actually waits to what turn her head. What are you trying to tell yeah. me? Yeah, she's right. like, and she's like, it's so funny because she gives it like a beat and a half, maybe two beats, and then turns her head, and it's such a comic timing moment. Mm-hmm. It's great because she hears that, tsk, 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 yeah, tsk, like of like the it's not a maraca, but like yeah, the well, maraca, the, the, yeah, yeah, well, there's the, the shaker, the, the, yeah, yeah, and her performance is I, I, the the back of the box kind of makes it seem like it's like an Arthur Hiller comedy, like it's like the in laws or something that like it's super funny. Or like it is, well, I mean, it it is an the, Arthur Hiller comedy, but it's not like the in laws. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, think, I do think the first half is leaning into. I mean, as, as grim as everything they're describing, it's leaning into satire. Mash, it's definitely mash, mash style. It's satire. definitely satire. The back of the box to me kind of made it seem like oh, and then you have like the woman that's like trying to do this and like this, like it's almost like a buddy comedy. It's, I don't know. Like it's an that rare, It's that rarity, a smart comedy. But that black nurse shaman sequence was so funny to me. Like, well, it, it, it's. It's a thing they do constantly in the film. It's like a character talks like a Patty Chayefsky character. Blah, 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 blah. What are you trying to tell me? Blah, 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 blah. Come again? Yeah, they always, yeah, everything is done twice or three times for comic effect. And by the way, to further my reading of the film, you will know that, look, we expect George C. Scott to talk like a Patty Chayefsky character. He is the lead in a Patty Chayefsky script, and he's George C. Scott, who can handle dialogue as well as anybody who's ever lived. For the most part, the other characters don't talk like Patty Chayefsky characters. They 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 read out uh, hospital jargon, but they don't really they don't talk in giant you know uh, uh, fifteen minute monologues until we get to Diana Rigg in the middle and later with Bernard Hughes. Yeah, Bernard Hughes. Uh, um, but again, it's literally one of the things. It's like, oh, finally he meets a character who sounds like him, who talks like him. <laughs> and Diana Rigg, she's so cool. Like I wanted to be her. I was like watching her, like how she talks and stuff. I'm like, man, I wish I was a Patty Chayefsky character. <laughs> She's just so like sure of herself and how she interfaces, as Roger said, like with George C. Scott. Like mm-hmm. it's really difficult to do when he's that volcanic and he's really erupting on screen. She just does such we a good talk- job. We were talking about mm-hmm. other people that I was uh, that I think yeah. Quentin were- threw out some really good alter- think, alternate I, casting ideas. I think I came up with a better one though, and I think it's one of the reasons why they went with Diana Rigg. I, I, I think she was supposed to be British. I'm sure when Patty Chayefsky was writing it, he was writing it for Julie Christie. Oh yeah, because you before you mentioned uh, Diane Keaton, yeah, I did, which yeah. I thought was a great a great yeah. casting choice as well. But I, mean, I I bet you I bet you they never got off of the Julie Christie idea. And so they say, well, let's keep it British. 
And either Jilly Christie turned it down or they decided not to, you know, because Dorsey Scott and Jilly Christie are in Batulia together. Mm -hmm. And they said, maybe let's not do a Batulia reunion. <laughs> Well, Diana Rigg rises to the occasion, and during that rape, it was just so weird to see the juxtaposing of him trying to be violent, mm -hmm. like trying to do mm -hmm. like a violent rape, mm -hmm. and her kind of – she's making love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's uh -huh. like caressing him and holding his face, and and it was just yeah. like these – it giving, was jarring yeah. watching those two taking clash her, together. She's giving herself to him, but she's also comforting him. I mean, she's like yeah, – She wants she, him. She's provoked this. Yeah, yes. I mean, in today's day and age – it was just it's startling and shocking to, yeah, yeah. to see. And, and I actually, I, I know, Dad, you have a problem with that scene afterwards where it's like, I love you, you love me. Just because it feels a little stagey to me. It does feel a little stagey, but I like the moment where it's like he's kind of, afterwards she leaves and he's grumbling and he opens up the window and he's like, okay, God damn it, I do love you, okay? Like, yeah, yeah. he just like calls I out have less of the a problem. Of, I have less of a problem with that now that uh, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've heard a, an alternate mm. Potential but also I would Roger all, Avery style yeah. reading, but Gala I, Avery style reading. But I will also, <laughs> but I will also say I kind of like that. No, I want you to quit and you you go with me. I like the fact that it, all of a sudden it it threw a fun little plot into the movie. Out of uh, everything has been so fucking grim. And now it's just a simple, like, look, you were going to kill yourself yesterday, so then why not run off with me uh, for a romantic idol? What do you've got to fucking lose? <laughs> well, also, what I like in that scene, though, is what she tells him is, like, you can be a doctor down in Mexico. Like, they really need you there. Mm -hmm, like, yeah. you can be a doctor again. Because he's at that crossroads where he isn't really practicing medicine anymore. He is just training all these other doctors. And it's just... Like, yeah. he's not really doing what his passion is. I anymore. actually really like his justification after that, where she's like, you know, you could make a difference. He's like, what, you think I'm not making a difference here? In the in the biggest hospital in, like, yeah. what are they, in New York? Yeah. In New York? <laughs> and then she just always goes, but you just tried to kill yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because of how useless you felt. That is a really fun little dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you that watch the movie before the episode comes out, you should watch it again with Quentin's reading. I think I'm going to go home and I'm going to watch it again with your reading because I think your reading is right. And for those of you that haven't seen the movie yet, go in and witness and experience and have fun. Uh, <laughs> don't. Yes, experience and have fun. <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of fun during this movie. It's a fun movie. It's a fun movie. Don't stream this on Amazon because there is an audio desync issue. I've reported it to the website. Hopefully by the time this episode comes out, it is fixed, but there's nothing worse. It's happened to me once or twice before on the platform, but there's nothing worse. Instead, you should stream this on Vudu, V-U-D-U. They actually have a high def quality but really, you should get the key home video. Mm -hmm. I agree. The key home video was fantastic. Um, I got mine for $25 from Frankie Latina's Video Vault. Frankie Latina. And I will read that the uh, the tape number at Video Archives. Is that this was uh, in the comedy section under H. And the tape number is 2373.